Welcome to A Podcast of Our Own, the unofficial podcast for A Room One's Own by Virginia Woolf. We're your hosts, Trent, Sam, and Ajit. So Sam, why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about the author herself? Okay, Trent. So Virginia Woolf was born January 25th in 1882 in South Kensington, an area of London. Uh, she was born from a very wealthy family, and she later became an author, novelist, and essayist. So it's kind of a mix of all of these. Her works generally define the constraints of typical text archetypes. Ajit, why don't you tell us about uh, one of her more famous works? So To the Lighthouse was written... <laughs> no, 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 the other no. one. Oh, no. the, oh, the other one? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so A Room of One's Own was published in 1929. It's an amalgamated essay talking about women in fiction. Her thesis in the essay is that women need a room of their own and money to write fiction. Trent, why don't you elaborate on how she does this? Yeah, Virginia Woolf approaches her arguments in a very interesting way in A Room of One's Own. Her writing style is very um, stream of thought-ish. It, it's pretty much exactly what she's thinking at the time. And the, and the way that she forms her argument varies a lot from the conventional sort of you make your point and then you provide concrete evidence and then you explain how they're related. Rather, she kind of makes the point and provides the evidence inherently through the narrative of the story. As you'll see, especially in, for example chapter one she is making a point about the way that interruptions can affect a writer by in fact having interruptions throughout the narrative and this is a very innovative and effective way of conveying the points throughout a room of one's own in today's episode we're going to be exploring the themes of the androgynous mind judith shakespeare money authorial choices interruptions gender inequality and class of course Major spoilers for A Room of One's Own are up ahead, so you've been warned. Watch out. So in this first segment, we're on the road with Robin, Julia, and Emily discussing gender inequality in A Room of One's Own. Please welcome Robin, Julia, and Emily. So today we will be talking about gender inequality in Virginia Woolf's book, A Room of One's Own. Um, this book has been largely accredited as a feminist novel, as gender inequality is a large motif throughout the book. This also allows the book to be related to not only the state of their society at the time, but also our society right now. Um, the metaphor that kicks off the book um, is really significant to me as it talks about a beetle who kicks her off the grass of a university as women are only allowed to be on the gravel. And along with this, she can't enter a library as she is not a fellow. During this time, she talks about a thought, and she says that this thought is very insignificant. She even compares it to a fish. Yeah, and this reminds me of a quote that I had discovered on chapter 3. Um, and this quote says, A very queer, composite being thus emerges. Imaginatively, she is of the highest importance. Practically, she is completely insignificant. And this quote shows um, how women carry this potential um, and they have the capabilities to be like men, but society um, displays them as being insignificant. Yeah, speaking of the insignificance of women, um, the quote that I found is um, that really stood out to me is, life for both sexes and i look at them shouldering their way along the pavement is arduous difficult and a perpetual struggle it calls for gigantic courage and strength more than anything perhaps creatures of illusion that we are it calls for confidence in oneself so she speaks in confidence in both sexes as men seem to have confidence as they push women down and create this social hierarchy and also um women seem to lose confidence from this gender inequality which will relate into their works as they feel like they have been taught that their work will never be as good as a man's and because of this they believe that their thoughts are or their ideas are insignificant a uh, symbol that really stood out to me is a cat without a tail i think we all enjoyed that one um so the narrator feels superiority over um, the cat, which has a sense of irony because she's basically reflecting on how a man is superior over a woman and how wrong that is in their society, and yet she's 
feels superior over this cat and this cat is imbalanced because he doesn't have a tail. So this can be compared to how a woman is imbalanced because she does not have a room. So she would never be able to perpetuate her thoughts in the same effect as a man does. That's a really good point and I think the um, the idea that the man is more important than the woman is really a universal um, feeling for women in this time that she is writing and even um, today those thoughts can still be felt. Uh, Virginia Woolf uses an illusion near the beginning of the book to kind of drive home her point that this is a feeling felt universally by women. Um, on page five she says, here then I was, call me Mary Beaton, Mary Seaton, Mary Carmichael, or by any name you please, it is not a matter of importance. Um, so these four Marys that she is referring to um, are the four Marys that were Mary Queen of Scots Lady in Waiting while she was um, queen. Uh, and this is like a well-known, uh, there's a song about it and it's a well-known story in England. So she's um, using this name to say, like, doesn't matter who I am as the narrator, my feelings are felt by all women. And kind of compounding that is that the name Mary is just so common that, you know, any women can I feel like to it. this reflects on the relatability of the story a lot. Like, she doesn't need to say her name or say, this is my story, because she's talking about their society as a whole. Exactly, and the fact she like refers to Mary Queen of Scots when this is written in the 1920s shows how this is a really long-lasting issue. Mm -hmm. And it's still present today as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the narrator in the book is given the name Mary as well. Her aunt is given the name Mary Beaton. Um, and then speaking of her aunt Mary Beaton, um, in the story her death um, is used to show financial inequality when she passes down her money to the narrator Mary. Um, on page 35, it says, My Aunt Mary Beaton, I must tell you, died by a fall from her horse when she was riding, out to take the air in Bombay. The news of my legacy reached me one night about the same time that the act was passed that gave the votes to women. Um, and this example shows something really out of the ordinary at this time for a woman to have financial um, independence or financial freedom and have her own money, where at the time money was almost exclusively passed down to um, sons from their fathers. Mm -hmm. This kind of ties back to the main point she's making in the book with the title A Room of One's Own, as Robin kind of mentioned, the need for a woman to have a room of her own to write successfully. And uh, maybe the most commonly quoted line in the book on page four says, all I could do was to offer you an opinion upon one minor point. A, room, a woman must have a money and a room of her own if she is to write fiction. Um, so this example shows that it is uncommon for her to have money and the room she needs to write fiction. And of course, this can be expanded to other professions at the time other than fiction. Mm -hmm. um, and then another large aspect within the novel is truth and specifically the subjectivity of truth. So Virginia Woolf discusses um, how controversial subjects make it hard to reveal the truth. And in this scenario, the controversial subject is equal rights to both men and women. And um, she also compares this to fiction, explaining that it's easier to believe fiction rather than the truth because this can be a threatening um, idea for the men in society um, if they believe the truth that women can be equal to them because it has a potential to remove their opportunities away and make them um, not just superior. Um, also, due to the unequal treatment of women, um, it's discussed how they've had less opportunities to display their potential. Um, and Wolf discusses that women have produced less impressive works of art or writing than men. And this is not to, um, not to do with the lack of their skill, um, but a lack of their given opportunities and um, they don't have their this opportunity to show their writing capabilities. Um, and to elaborate on, uh, to elaborate on this, um, 
she uses the example of an imaginary woman named Judith Shakespeare, who would have been the sister of William Shakespeare. And um, she explains how Judith would have been equally as talented as her brother, um, but she would not have been recognized. And it is not to do with um, the fact that she would be um, not as good of a writer as he was, but because society didn't believe that she had the same opportunities as her brother would. Um, and this is just another example of how um, women were constantly provided with disadvantages and how their skills were not able to be displayed. I think that example of the like thinking of the concept of Judith Shakespeare really shows Virginia Woolf's like talent in writing because mm -hmm. it is such a just a thought-provoking idea to think and it still has relevance today. Yeah, and also because William Shakespeare is so highly recognized, it was a good example to show um, you know, what would have happened in history if yeah, he did have I think a sister. It's pretty brave of her too at this time mm -hmm. to bring up such a great um, author in that light. Yeah, exactly. I think that really um, allowed people to almost relate to her writing mm -hmm. a little bit more as she brings up this amazing writer, but mm -hmm. there is someone else who could have been as equally as good as him if she had been given the opportunities that he was given. Yeah, and it puts into perspective this controversial subject because some people cannot um, bring themselves to believe that um, everyone should be equal and whenever they can view this as such a recognizable person that is talented um, they can really create these ideas that maybe there is um, a need for equality. Mm -hmm. I find that it's very interesting that even using this novel we can relate it to such grander aspects um, throughout our society like women are still fighting for their voices to be heard so I think this novel is important in order to allow um, our society to continue to reflect on these issues. Mm -hmm. Really I well agree. said, Robin. Yeah. I really like the point that you made about the, the four Marys and the narrator's story. I think that that allusion really plays into the point about um, Virginia Woolf's interesting writing style and how she uses the narrative itself to argue her points rather than a structured argument. Um, it's quite interesting. For the next segment, we're going to be looking at the issue of money and Alexis, Leo, and Sydney will be explaining this to us. Welcome to this segment of a podcast of our own. I'm your host, Leo, and today we are joined by Alexis and Sydney. We will be unpacking a certain overlooked aspect of the thesis statement in Virginia Woolf's extended essay, A Room of One's Own. As you're probably familiar by now, Woolf's thesis is, a woman must have money and a room of her own if she is to write fiction. Now, many people have already discussed the room of her own part, analyzing it as both literal and figurative. The amount of analysis that it goes through is only natural. What exactly does Wolf mean by a room of one's own? But what about money? Why is money a seemingly very straightforward and easy to comprehend topic often left out of the discussion? Let's unpack that here now. To start with a summary, through the point of view of unnamed narrative, Wolf gives us the perspective of many of the women of her time and of today. It connects to the idea of this work that it doesn't matter what back background you are coming from because it is, as she wrote, not a matter of any importance from what situation you are in. This work is about the idea of women, women and the challenges they go through to be able to write and have a room of their own, Although and although those are not the only two things needed to be able to provide an, an environment to develop proper ideas, a way of writing that isn't about the person themselves. One point that Wolf makes in 
chapters 1 and 2 highlights the differences between the men's and women's colleges. The main difference she notes is the food, for which men is something to be in awe of, while the women's food is something which doesn't have much character or isn't worth discussing. The topics of discussion that they have are majorly different, as in the men's college they talk about more scholarly topics and have more of the knowledge needed to speak on different ideas and develop those ideas based around other things they have learned. And in the women's college, however, the topics of discussion are based around gossip, as they do not have a proper basis or ability to develop more scholarly thoughts because they don't have the same education provided to them because of the idea that women don't um, have the proper money needed for this. So, in your opinion, what is it that Wolf could be saying or bringing up around the idea of the two colleges being so different? Um, by looking at what she had to say around how the two colleges are built, this can be explored. She explains that in older days, the kings and queens had buried gold and silver into the ground, and this has helped wealth to sprout. However, this metaphor only really applies to the men's college. While the men's college has many pathways in which to gain money and keep their education more, the women's college starts out with less. The quote, why did men drink wine and women water? Why was one sex so pauperous and the other so poor? Explain this, explains this well. The ground on which it is built can be seen as how the mothers of the daughters weren't able to make money to pass down, which in turn makes for base what they need and want to stand on unstable and less of a possibility. All right, so my first question to you is the role of money in women and fiction, since that is what Wolf is writing on. Well, um, I think that we can't really just single out like the importance of money in fiction, because um, if a woman has money, she is automatically opened up to many different paths that she wouldn't be exposed to otherwise. Um, Money enables many things, from exposure to literature and um, education in general. It opens up opportunities for meeting great writers of their time, and in turn helping women to gain social status. So is opportunity only accessible through money? How severely is one's freedom restricted without money? Well, Wolf argues that the absence of female fiction is a result of a lack of opportunity rather than a distinct absence of talent. Um, in, in the book, I'll quote her, and she said, Intellectual freedom depends upon material things. Poetry depends on intellectual freedom. And women have always been poor, not for 200 years merely, but from the beginning of the time. Women have been less in, had less intellectual freedom than the sons of Athenian slaves. Women, then, have not had a dog's chance of writing poetry, that is why I've laid so much stress on money and a room of one's own. Financial freedom grants women the ability to be free from men and to be independent and to write what her heart desires without the burden of struggling to survive. In chapter six, Wolf acknowledges that poor writers had written beautiful pieces of literature before, but, Wolf's ar but Wolf argues that the list of the greatest writers um, on the list that they, they are all well off and this further emphasizes her point because even when even great male writers are really wealthy and only in rare cases where a poor man could make a name for himself by being a writer. In this case, Wolf shows how both genders have been bound to the need of financial freedom in order to become creative. Wolf also suggests women have been denied financial freedom because of men's insecurity and their need to be superior of women. Throughout the whole book, she like uses the view of a feminist to write um, her experience. And in there, there are a lot of situations where uh, either she gets interrupted or she gets disrespected because of her gender. And here, she, she suggests that without financial freedom, um, women will always be dependent of a man and therefore always inferior of a man. And that's why it is important for financial uh, dependence so she can have the ability to buy a room of her own to have her creative thoughts. Now, Wolf talks a lot about gender inequality in her essay, and while money is 
often still relevant. What exactly happens when things go beyond the material aspect? When a woman has bought the tools she needs to write, Wolf lets us know that they, are st they still face a significant challenge, one that revolves around the social aspect of things. She has talked about if women and men had access to the equal and same resources, such as education, women will still struggle to find a place among men. Can you explain why and what does money do that would help overcome this problem? Well, in her book, she also mentions about uh, high-class and well-off women writing books, but they get isolated from the community because they're considered witty and not respectable. Uh, women of their time do not look up to the writer as like an inspirational figure or role. Instead, they look at her as a, a rebel that is writing to prove a point. Say, for example, to prove that they can write just as good as a man. So I think that even though a woman can have the financial stability or a room of her own, basically, she'll still have a lot of stigma sticked to her name or her work because of how women were viewed. So what exactly is Wolf's point about money? Is it an addition in her thesis to a room of one's own, or do they need to go together? Is one essential for the other? In other words, can you provide a brief conclusion to her argument? Um, so throughout this text, the difference between poverty and money is explored thoroughly, including the difference between women in poverty and women who have family money. While women in poverty have not as much money or no money, uh, they have to find a way on their own to gather money, and it highlights the, a lot of difficulties that they can face. For women with money through their families, there is the highlighted point in the work of how there are so many pressures that they also face, including the pressure to marry into a wealthy family, which if they fight against their family not to, it can cause them to like lose status. And it also includes how it wasn't even necessarily encouraged um, of them to be allowed to pursue their own form of higher education. And this kind of example helps for someone to be able to understand what the point Wolf is also making about how women of wealthier families would often write through anger and with more resentment towards people and their situation, while women who have less but got the opportunity to write and read would focus on the possibilities of what if. This also connects to the idea that she highlights around how money is needed for women and fiction to become a possibility. The idea of women in fiction in this work kind of explores the idea of how these essays and work of Virginia Woolf all, almost highlights that this is a fictional thing that she is talking about for people of the time. However, um, this is something she would want for all women to be able to have money and a room of their own, and something she might not believe is a pure reality, and which still isn't to this day. I really enjoyed this section about money here, and I think that it's really one of uh, Virginia Woolf's most timeless arguments in A Room of One's Own. Especially the portion where uh, I think she delves deeply into the way that women traditionally and historically lacked money and how that affected their ability to write. Um, and how money is passed down through generations, typically only from, you know, men to men. And there's not a whole lot of money passed from women to women. Even in today's society, of course, there's historical vestiges of this where oftentimes male children are the ones that take majority of wealth will take states and will take properties and will take over companies and how this kind of leads to difficulties for women trying to rise and their social economic status or rise to a status of which they'd be able to comfortably write so i think now we're going to move on to our next group Yes, so in this next section, Beth, Rehan, and Arya will be discussing how the androgynous mind is shown in A Room of One's Own. So today we're going to talk about the androgynous mind from Virginia Woolf, A Room of One's Own. We're kind of focusing on the man-womanly and woman-manly way of writing in her book. Um, I think a lot of people could define the androgynous mind as kind of like being aware of 
both sexes make it female and male. Almost like a mix of the two and not biased or leaning towards one or the other. Like yeah. writing a novel with a, not a specific gender in mind. Yeah. yeah. And I think um, Renee Wolf in the book, she kind of brought up Mary Carmichael and she was like a new author. So a lot of the female authors, they didn't have like tradition behind them. So they were like, who do we look to? Our mothers were household people. They didn't really interact with knowledgeable communities. I think back then only men wrote and only men had shared their opinions and experiences, so it made it diff difficult for women to start their career. And so I think she was more inclined to like choose a man's sentence, but it was more straightforward. I feel like it's very way yep. one way to categorize. Also, writing. as we've learned about um, Virginia Woolf, we like through our whole childhood, a lot of um, famous literary characters. Um, will came and visit visit her family, and so that was probably a big influence on her writing style as well. And can is probably why she was so interested in the androgynous mind while writing. Yeah, I think if we think about it today, like the androgynous mind is kind of very common. We'd see it like we'd find it to be like an everyone because we've been like brought up through like the cultural revolution and yeah. everything. It's just around us, you know. It's yeah. more applied to gender nowadays than compared to liter literacy, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There isn't a little big literary s scene today, it's more about the media. Yeah. And, like, you know, the whole d differentiating, even in literature, like about a man's sentence, woman's sentence, it's like kind of depicting a woman as completely emotional and a man as completely straightforward when it could be either or. It's like very stereotypical and almost old fashioned, but it's describing something that's like newly seen almost modern. Yeah, which yeah. is why it's so interesting that Virginia Woolf had this concept when she was writing the book at this time. Yeah, she was way, like, she had way more insight at that time, and I think, I think at that time people saw it as normal when people were, like, described as either this or either that, but, like, she was basically speaking for our time. She was. Yeah. And you can see that through the whole entire book, not just about the judgment one, that all of the concepts are very modern. Yeah. Herself as a writer. Can we talk about that? Like, do you think she's androgynous? I do. When I, I think she is androgynous. Like I wouldn't have. You can only tell she's a female writer when she talks about the like strong feminist views and like everything she encounters, and you can kind of pick up on that she is a woman. But also, a man could have the similar feelings. I nowadays. feel like you could tell that she was a female writer if you knew the time that it was written in, and you could probably by the like things she said about World War One and stuff. Just because, like, back then, not many women had the same point of view and perspective and thoughts that she had. Yeah, and, like, personally, I think that she definitely had, like, a natural talent for writing and, like, yes. speaking and advocacy and all that. Mm -hmm. And not to, like, diminish her talent, but, like, um, Leonard as a writer, like, her husband. I think just um, being around that atmosphere when, like, a ma ma man's mind was thinking about how to write and everything could have had some influence on her yeah. take on this subject, but not necessarily completely, because yeah. humans can't be completely void of bias, <laughs> but... Absolutely. Yeah. I also think whole parents... Um, parenting style also influenced her work a lot because they seemed to be very open about her education and then to put a divide between her and her brothers. Mm -hmm. And so that's probably why she started thinking androgynously from a young age. Yeah. And like, okay, ranges of androgynous, like how would we describe that? Mm -hmm. There is definitely a range. Like people can be very yeah. androgynous and then kind of and then lean towards. And I don't think there's any wrong way to do it. Like some people just feel more one gender than the other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like a whole spectrum. Yeah. I don't know why I love the word spectrum. <laughs> it's a good way to define it. Yeah. yeah. There's like, no other real way to say exactly what it is. Yeah. Like one to ten. Yeah, one to ten. What would you think she is? Virginia Woolf? Yes. One being like super masculine, ten being super feminine? She definitely yeah. has a little bit of more feminine. Yes. Just because we could see that as she expressed like her... Um, upsetness or like sadness like yeah. whenever there were situations of like direct um things addressing about the female community mm -hmm. and she stood up for herself she yeah. did she i did. also think it's also i wonder like if she did i know she's known for her mood swings that's definitely like a feminine character but i wonder if they just accentuated that because of the time she mm -hmm. wrote this book and if that actually was how she acted like she definitely did have depression but i wonder if since she was such a small and well-educated woman they wanted to 
pinhole down with these kinds of stereotypes. Mm-hmm. But it could have been, but not I think topic. <laughs> <laughs> but like, even if you think about it, it takes an androgynous mind to like view one. I would say because True. a person outside of it would just be looking at it and be like, their views are non-existent to us, kind of. Yeah, you right. know, they Definitely. wouldn't be able to differentiate. I feel like she is a solid seven towards. Yeah. She is definitely yeah. feminine. She's an advocate, like, 100%. through and through. Yeah. But she is androgynous, and I feel, and maybe, like, if we read more of her walks, like, in this one, she definitely is leaning toward the more feminine side yeah. and the androgynous spectrum, but maybe her other walks won't yeah. like that, maybe. right? Because this one's specifically towards women's rights. Yeah, yeah, women in fiction. Yeah, women yeah. in fiction. Yeah. She did really well. I think she like portrayed the view of people very easily. And I think, let's just, okay, so today we think it's like more modern, more common to view in a genre's minds. Like, I personally think that, um, so J.K. Rowling, she's like the author of Harry Potter, right? Yeah. So, and I love Harry Potter, <laughs> okay? But at the beginning of the movies, like, she really depicted like a 19th century household. Right. So there was always that, um, the cousin's mom in the kitchen cooking yeah. and cleaning, and then there was the, hu- the husband going to work and like, <laughs> like sort of showing his like views and everything, mm-hmm. and like creating a patriarchal sense. And yeah, we didn't find it weird because that that's the way things were. Yeah, but definitely further into the movie, she made it way more balanced. Like, yeah. like the young girls and like the visiting school and stuff, they were getting access to education, getting their mm-hmm. points of view spoken, and like there were women in power positions and stuff like that. Right. Who do you, who else do you think like has something like that? Um, kind of go in the other direction, but Twilight, like that movie series and books, I'm not gonna lie, I have loved them since <laughs> I was little. <laughs> I'm trying not to, but they're definitely written towards a more feminine and like female view, and I definitely know that the author was female from the beginning. Everything mm-hmm. she writes is just more... You knew that before you yeah, I like the author was. Yeah, you can just tell by the way she describes Edward and the way she writes and the, um, exaggerates certain points right. of everything. Do you think that characterizes the female thing so much? Like, the female character? Just by exaggeration, we sort of fall into that category? I don't know. I think Maybe. it's hard to put myself in a box like that. Yeah. I guess, because some days, yeah. But then other days, I'm not at all. Like, I don't. Yeah. So. But guys, specifically, the baseball scene. <laughs> <laughs> Man or woman? <laughs> um... When I was, like, thinking about androgynous minds, no, uh, like, authors came to mind or writers because I don't really read that much. But um, (laughs) Emma Chamberlain, just as a celebrity, she's very young, but she's very androgynous, I feel like. She dresses even in, like, an androgynous way. She has an androgynous mind and, like, the way she expresses herself, I feel like, is very just... Yeah, so, like, the whole, like, literature period that used to be, but now it's more media, like, that's it. Yeah, it's hard to apply that. Yeah, so So I feel like the point you made about Emma Chamberlain, she really brought the Indrana's mindset to her appearance, like, her physical appearance, like, portrayed what she knew, what she believed in. Another example, Harry Styles. Oh, yeah. It's so androgynous. I was just at, like, his style, the way he portrays Mm -hmm. his fans, like, the way he acts, his songs, it's all so androgynous. Yeah. And I think that's why we're so, he's so popular right now because everyone really appreciates that yeah it's really being then, normalized in our society now. yes like it's not something there's no like specific category you fit yourself into yeah virginia will saw that it would take a hundred years to like get us here yeah. in that mindset but i think we still need oh yeah just more yeah. years to it's get not us. perfect but it's a lot it's virginia wolf kind of did it change or did it not change like all of her concepts she brings up because she's talking about these now but we're still talking about the issues now, a Josh's mind has definitely improved a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One of the issues in the book, I think, that's improved a lot is a Josh's mind. Yeah. And the way she relates it to, like, every writer having this quality and this characteristic. Yeah. Like, I think she focused on, like, um, so she was focusing on, what's it called, men and women. And men had their time and space, but, like, women didn't. And so they had to resort to, like, having their more fictitious novels and everything because mm-hmm. they couldn't spend too much time on it. And it was just, like... Wow, you kind of have to even. But today, you, women have that time, but then it's like more specific to families. Yeah. Another thing I would like to bring up, just like before we end here, is men, man sentences versus women sentences. Yeah. Mhm. 
Yeah, I know, right? Um, like, um, the man's sentences, they usually, she depicted it more as clinical and, like, very straightforward and out there. And then while a woman's sentence just had to be emotional because that was what they were characterized by. Yeah, they weren't very sure of themselves, like, after the World War and, like, even before, I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah. Like, they weren't sure of themselves. No one could support them. They were never agreed with. Mm-hmm. And I feel like men will. Yes. So they were confident in everything yeah. they were doing. And then, like, when Mary Carmichael just started bringing up her new stories, she used the man's sentences and stuff. And so, like, she just, she, she, Virginia Woolf found Mary Carmichael's book a little, like, to the side of more boredom. Mm, yeah. Because it wasn't very hers, like, yeah. you know? Mm-hmm. It was either, it was, well, it was more man sentence. Um, and just as a fun activity... So, like, I'm going to la- name some movies, some famous movies, and you guys need to guess if it was written by a man or a woman. So, like, this is kind of, like, making an assumption, but that's kind of what, like... Just to see if you guys can tell if it's a female or male writer. Right. And feel, jo- feel free to join in. Yeah, and if there's, like, kind of a mix of opinions, then that means they're probably more on the androgynous side. So, first, we have Forrest Gump. Man or woman? Who? Man. That's good. Um, man? I want to say man. Correct, man. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> um, The Lion King, man or woman? Ooh, I don't know. Ooh. Um, I want to say woman. I want to say woman, too. Yeah, woman. <laughs> okay, are we characterizing this a bit? No, I'm not scared. Scared. We did practice this before, but not with these ones. Yeah. No, so yeah. I so promise we're not fun. cheating. <laughs> Next, Spy Kids, man or woman? Man? Man. Yeah, man. Oh my god. Let's go. <laughs> Next Let's one. Go. Shrek, man or woman? I want to say woman. Man. Oh, oh my god. god. <laughs> Shrek. Okay. <laughs> hey. She's the man. Man or woman? Oh my woman. god. Have you seen it? Yeah, I've yes. seen it. I love that movie. It's a really good movie. I want to say man. Woman. Oh, damn. <laughs> Um, one last one. Let's go with Jurassic Park. Ooh, man. Man, man and woman. Wow. Uh, Trick question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Trick Jurassic Park's a good movie. <laughs> okay, well, thanks guys for joining us today. Yeah, thank you. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, that says a lot about society. Yeah, thank you guys. So, yeah, I I think that this sort of idea about writing is pretty interesting and like an interesting perspective on analyzing somebody's literature so Ajit do you have like what do you think of the androgynous slide and how it's kind of evolved over time I feel like in recent years it's become more and more important to write with an androgynous mind and just have that androgynous mindset when you're thinking about things in general Mm -hmm. because of like um, more and more we realize the importance of, uh, representing, representing, like, all, mm-hmm. sen- all genders and all sexualities in our society, and, um, I mean, recently mm-hmm. there's been, like, a big influx of, like, LGBTQ writing, mm-hmm. especially, and in that we can really see, uh, that androgynous mind that they talked about. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I feel like in that sense it's become really important recently. Yeah, and I agree with that, like, it, and there's definitely, I feel like I've read some you know, writings that you could tell were not written by somebody who identifies under LGBTQ sort of sexualities. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, it kind of hurts. But I, I feel like, you know, especially nowadays, I feel like there's kind of been a shift where, you know, maybe not all writings more androgynous, but, and I think this is a good thing. I think it's like there's writing that's like, you know, written from a like male sort of mindset so like male voice and there's also writing by a female voice but nowadays compared to 100 years ago they're a lot more balanced you know Mm -hmm. um like there's there's more there's closer to an equal amount of each while also there's being a bigger mix along the spectrum in the middle i think that is really valuable because like you know um i think beth was talking about about twilight Mm mm-hmm I, th- I, th- I think there's value in Twilight, even if it's not that androgynous, like they're saying, it's enjoyable, right? Yeah. Like, and there's certain things to be enjoyed in writing that's not necessarily um, free of, like, gender 
gendered ideas you know Mm -hmm. so yeah i i I agree with that i think there's like there's definitely like a place for writing that's not necessarily androgynous and like i mean Mm -hmm. maybe not clearly but definitely is gendered but i think um in like a grand scheme of things it is important that like we still consider uh having an androgynous mind Mm -hmm. when we write about things and we um discuss certain topics yeah Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i think especially if you're looking at works of literature that you know succeed widely or like incredibly widely acclaimed the the great pattern will you you will find is that they write with a very androgynous mind and in an like androgynous voice because by doing that you can appeal to a lot of people and i think that a lot of people just yeah they they appreciate that nowadays that everybody feels and acts realistically and there's a lot of value in that if you're trying to you know write good fiction you're really trying to immerse the reader in that world having you know people of all you know identities act realistically is super valuable Mm -hmm. and i i think this idea of like universality applies not just to gender or sexuality but just to like all things like race for example we see more and more in recent memory yeah. like a, a lot of the movies that we watch or the books that we read they they're more inclusive in terms of race as well yeah i think it's just a good direction for the world to be going now now it's time for a message from our sponsors has this ever happened to you i have so many options i hate this what am i ever gonna watch <gasps> it's already 10 o'clock well let me introduce you to dusk with dusk you don't have to spend hours each night searching for a movie to watch we will provide you with a curated list of just Twilight, tailor-made for your needs. With Twilight, you can get all of those experiences in one package. And more. You need a Christmas movie? How about a Halloween movie? What about that summer action blockbuster? You just got married. It's your birthday tomorrow and you have no friends. What about all of the above? We got you covered. With Twilight, you can get all of those experiences in one package. And more. Really? Really. This sounds too good to be true. How much does it cost? Oh, that's just the thing. It's free. We just need a uh, we just need a copy of your birth certificate, your social insurance number, and all of your uh all of your assets. I have all of those. That's perfect. I can't wait. Sign up now at 1-800-DUSK-THE-STREAMING-SERVICE.COM. Dusk. Pick a movie before the sun goes down. Our next segment is going to focus on Judith Shakespeare. By Ada and Campbell. Hey guys, welcome to the next segment of a podcast of our own. It's Campbell and Ada, and uh, basically it's a ca- casual conversation between the two of us, and one of us is pretending that we have no clue uh, what this book is about, and the other one is pretending that they are very knowledgeable on it. So, here we go. Okay, so we were talking about this book in class, right? The book is called A Room of One Zone, and we had this interesting discussion about the part of the book that refers to the idea of Judith Shakespeare. Judith Shakespeare? Is that is that William Shakespeare's mom or something? Um, no. So the whole idea of the book is to bring light to the issue of degradation of women and to spread the idea of feminism. Okay, okay. And the meaning behind the title of the book is also very interesting if you look at it. So the writer, Virginia Woolf, says that in order for a woman to write fiction, she must have two things, a room of one's own and enough money to support herself. Okay, okay. Uh, When was this book written? Um, I believe it was written 100 years ago, which is definitely a long time ago. Yeah. But the ideas actually presented in the book are quite modern by the looks of, I mean, if you look at it from a point of feminism. Yeah, it makes it makes sense um, why also since if about a hundred years ago now, um, it makes sense that it would be incredibly difficult for some people, like example, like some, for some women to get access to a room of their own and money because I know it's completely different times back then. Definitely. But why are we talking about Judas Shakespeare? Okay, so you, so you see the deal with Judas Shakespeare is that she doesn't exist. Okay, that makes no sense at all. Okay, hear me out. It's a hypothetical concept. Virginia Woolf basically is asking if there was a Judas Shakespeare, a female version of William Shakespeare, where everything would be the exact same but their gender. And the question is, would Judith have had all the success and fame that William Shakespeare did due to to his literature? Okay, okay. So it's basically talking about how if there's an exact copy of William, Mm -hmm. um, if if there's an exact copy of that and he had all the time and space to do these incredible works, um, what happens if she did? 
uh, yeah. if she had the exact same opportunities, which mm -hmm. would she have had all those opportunities? Exactly. Okay. Um, I actually, I read this article just the other day. Um, uh, I think it was uh, Jan Martel, Jan Martel. He's, okay. he's the guy who wrote The Life of Pi. Basically, he actually wrote um, something on the lines of, I don't really remember it, um, but I know it's something on the lines of, it's a, everything on his desk was just like a table with, table with a computer, mm -hmm. and he has like a couple pieces of paper on it, and that's it. But it's a room all by itself, and he just focuses and sits down, and that's where he does everything. Okay. Yeah. And, well, um, Virginia Woolf also talks about how women didn't really get that. They didn't really get their own personal space, and it kind of points, I mean, it's kind of the title of the book, Room of One's Own. Okay, okay. The idea of Judith Shakespeare also makes me think of how many people with absolutely breathtaking literature and talent to write and create this art form live through the word ever discovering them, which would be because they are a woman. That's true. It's just complete, completely shot down. Zero opportunities because they're... It's, I know uh, it's a bit insensitive to say stuff like this. Just know that I don't mean it at all. But like, yeah. it's, the people make jokes about like, oh yeah, get back to the kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just, it's, Which that's is just how not, people live back then, right? It, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's true. It's, the reason it's funny is it's because it's true. It's because it's based off of actual realities uh -huh. um, and the history of the world. It's, 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 pretty, it's pretty sad, but it's, it's good that now, now um, in the present, it's getting a lot more even, and it, things are changing, and we can see it. It's, there's proof everywhere of it. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'd like to actually talk more about the book, and I'll give you like more of a rundown of it. Okay. So... For this book that we read into the Thoughts of Wolf, where Judith Shakespeare wants to read, write, and experience the world, just like her brother will. But because she's a woman, she isn't allowed to go to school. She is forced to do the things people say women are supposed to do, staying home, cooking, cleaning, basically looking after the males, which okay, you Yeah, the, the basic housewife type of thing. Yeah, exactly. So Wolf further develops this character, where Judith manages to do some reading and writing, and I quote, up in an apple of loft on the sky, on the sly, sorry, but it's not enough. Towards the end of the story, her parents try to marry her off to a boring wood stapler who smells like sheep. <laughs> but because of her views and intelligence, she sees her own talent and thinks it's unjust for her to be tied to a husband that she doesn't like, love or value, only to serve him, birth his children, and just to serve and raise those children she might not have even wanted. Okay, so she basically, she's, she's scared of getting, getting trapped, being yeah. forced into a life where she has zero, zero will, her opinions don't matter, and she can't even express her, her favorite things to do. She can't even express her hobbies. She can't write anymore. Yeah, so she runs away. She runs away from a home to seek her fortune in London. But you know, her story doesn't really end happily. She kills herself. She kills herself because she was set to failure by society, only because she was born with two X chromosomes, and a different set of genitals. That's 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 actually really sad. Mm -hmm. I think it's really interesting that Virginia Woolf kind of went went that far and went that deep into the into the topic and actually fully brought up the fact that some like if if she was smart, she realized the opportunities and mm -hmm. the opportunity she was going to get. And by the opportunities, I mean not many opportunities to express what yeah. she actually wants to do. So. And she saw the opportunity there. She saw that woman couldn't have done all of this, yeah. even if they had the absolute talent. Because mm -hmm. William Shakespeare is seen as, like, the number one writer that has ever existed, right? Mm -hmm. So, and here comes a question with that. Do you think the view of woman has changed drastically as we, know, as we show and talk about it in the media? 100%. I think, I think it's fantastic. We see, we see in politics today, um, people argue that about lots of different, um, like, it's... it's 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 not fifty fifty, uh, not fifty percent, fifty percent um, yet in politics between uh, men and women. But it's um, it's 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 really it's really impressive seeing how uh, society is finally viewing the norm as allowing w men and women to be completely equal, which it should have been like this for a long time. Mm -hmm. But it's it's crazy that it's only happening now. Right, and there is definitely less stigma around women being writers, but. In the workplace, I've, I've been hearing a lot more specifically about the sports events. I've heard that women get paid less, and uh, there's a conversation about that that we hear quite a lot in the media. Mm, yeah, okay. I actually, yeah, I've, I've talked to other people about this before, but um, 
the difference between people in the, in the sporting events is that the, some people argue that women um, still are getting paid less in other areas, which I 100% believe that women are still being getting paid less in certain areas. But I guess sporting events is one of those actually exceptions where I think it kind of makes sense why they are. Why is that? Um, it's, it sounds bad saying that without any context, but with the context, it actually makes a lot more sense. So basically, um, you have got to view it as, let's say, um, the top top and it, the top hockey league, NHL. Mm-hmm. Um, they get tons of fans every game. There's tons of merchandise. They 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 bring in a massive amount of income. Right. Everyone wants to be there. Every yeah, t- all the time. You see tons of news about it all the time. It's it's a big deal in Canada at yeah. least. Um, but um, I I can actually tell you honestly. I I personally am forgetting. It's slipping my mind the name of the women's national Ho- national hockey league. I think it might be that uh-huh. what I just said. I don't even remember the full name. It's it brings in significant less audience and income and all of the above. So you're saying the less fans bring less in less fans, income the for the women. Exactly. It's hard. It's hard to pay people the exact same amount as men if they're not bringing in the exact same amount of money. Right. So you're saying that there is actually a reason why women get paid less now. Yeah, for some reasons. Um, I 100% would have to do more research for other things. Um, maybe we can talk about this in a future time. Okay, yeah, definitely. So, tying back to the novel, I think besides showing the mistreatment of women, which is basically the whole point of the novel, Wolf mm-hmm. is bringing up the Judas Shakespeare paradox in order to compensate for the silences of history and to explain women's presumed literary science. I mean, silence. Okay. Mm-hmm. And she also says in her book, which I really found to be an interesting quote, um, she lives in you and me. And many other women who are not here tonight, but for they are washing up the dishes and putting the children to bed. Yeah. Mhm. This sounds like um yeah, it sounds like a really interesting book. Um, I think I'm gonna need to need to borrow it from you. I I kind of want to read this. All right, sounds good. Yeah, it definitely is interesting. And the best part of it is that it was written a hundred years ago, right? Uh, which is surprising that her views were so modern, but it's probably sad to think that she's not the only person with these thoughts. She's probably the only person that actually had the courage to speak her mind and get heard, which touches on the point of the Judas Shakespeare paradox. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank See you. ya. Well, that that was interesting. Oh yeah, definitely. I, I, th- th- I thought it was really interesting. I really liked um, that Campbell's point that he made about the hockey leagues, I, I do think definitely, even to this day, uh, women still struggle to find an audience and um, aren't given the same kind of audience that men are. Yeah, and I think that that's probably like still prevalent nowadays in literature as well, where like you, you find that women might struggle more to pick up a bigger fan base because people are still stuck in like a like weird sort of on like like passively sexist mindset Mm -hmm. do you think the fact that like many female authors still use uh their initials as an alias has kind of fed that a bit like i feel like there's a bit of a lack of female role models in literature um almost because of that sometimes yeah but i mean i don't know because the reason why a lot of women do that is because they don't like want people to know that they're women because they feel like it'll like hurt their chances of picking up a good audience Mm -hmm. you know but then by doing that are they hurting their female audience as well i think that just says a lot about society in the sense that um uh, women still feel that um they have to have a like a more male name in order to find the same kind of the like a wider audience yeah i think Mm -hmm. it is still trying to like shoehorn both sides into one or the other like when really a lot of it can be more ambiguous Mm-hmm. Androgynous, even? Mm-hmm. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Wow. Welcome back to another segment of a podcast of our own. I'm Teresa. I'm Tracy. And I'm Lisa. Let's begin our second. Oops. Sorry for that. Uh, mm, okay. Um, imagine it's the Black Friday night and your dream new fridge is on an 80% sale. You're sitting in front of your computer, preparing to snatch it by all means before it's sold out. And out of the blue, your dad yells at you to go down and wash the dishes. You're distracted. The moment you look back, the buy button is now gray and your dream mini fridge is sold out. Uh, your dream is now gone and you can feel your heart breaking. That's devastating, Lisa. 
Um, although hunting sale is not really my thing, being distracted by my parents yelling at me to do housework is definitely something relatable. Sometimes it got to the point that I could only write important essay like the EE or IA after everyone in my family has gone to sleep just to avoid all the distraction from my family. I could totally agree with you guys. One interruption could easily cut off your thinking. Not being able to continue your stream of thought is one thing, but in that moment, you might also forget your previous ideas too. But um, how is this related to our topic today? Uh, well, we'll be talking about the motif of interruption in Virgin- Virginia Woolf's A Room of One Song. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, now let's dive into the ways in which Virginia Woolf explored this motif in her work. A woman needs a room of her own to write fiction. As part of the thesis of Wolf's essay on women and fiction, it has both a literal and metaphorical meaning. In a literal sense, it is the comfort of accommodations and private space. Metaphorically, it is the freedom from the traditional roles of women and from the demands of people in her life. Um, yeah, I think... Uh, uh, the- Okay, you go first. <laughs> okay. Um, I think um, the connection between this motif and that part of her thesis is pretty straightforward. Um, throughout the essay, the author expressed her thoughts on how women are constantly being distracted by their own societal roles. We made her points very clear that women never have half an hour that they could call their own. Therefore, a woman needs to have a room of her own to be free from all distractions. You could continue with that, Tracy. <laughs> um, what really intrigued me is the methods that Virginia Woolf used to convey her argument. Aside from clearly explaining her point, she also indirectly demonstrated this by talking about how, time and time again, just as the narrator seems to be on the verge of an insight, her thinking is cut off by a male uh, authoritative figure trying to keep her in her place. This, for me, is very ingenious of her. Yeah, I think I have a pretty good idea of what you're talking about. One example is in chapter 1, when the narrator sits on the banks of a river at Oxbridge and ponders the question of women and fiction. In the middle of her flow of thought, she is interrupted by a beetle, yeah. a university security guard who enforces the rule by which women are not allowed to walk onto the grass. Yeah, I really like this example too. It's interesting how Wolf represent the process of developing an idea in terms of catching a fish. So to explain this, the narrator is waiting for a thought or a fish to come. But as soon as the fish catches the bait, she's distracted by a male telling her where her proper place is. This causes the precious fish to escape, and the idea that she just has is also gone. Uh, the narrator claimed, uh, later claimed that no great harm has been done, but we all know that for writers, a small idea could probably change their entire writing career. This detail also seemed to imply that women are distracted so many times on a daily basis that they feel that this is normal. But with this constant disruption, women writers are bound to face difficulties and even failure in their writing career. Mm-hmm. Just like Tracy, I also really like that example you guys just brought up, but I also have something else to add. Um, I think this might be covered in another segment of this podcast, but I just want to briefly mention about Judith Shakespeare. Um, I think it is like a perfect example for this as well. In chapter 3, Wolf implied that Judith Shakespeare, despite her brilliant talent in writing just like her brother, fails in leaving a legacy in the literature world because she could not overcome the interruptions society and nature set up for her. Judith is forced to marry at a very early age, then to board children and to fulfill her roles as a woman. This inevitably interrupts her writing career. Though she tries to escape from this major disruption, her unexpected pregnancy with another man comes as another interruption and, well, this eventually leads to her downfall. Yeah, Judith is just a fictional character, but I guess that everyone can agree that this unfortunate story has happened numerous times to women throughout history. But there's always an exception to everything, right? What's Virginia's Wolf take on that? 
Well, actually, Virginia did mention one exception to this um pessimistic fate for women's writer. Virginia Woolf identifies interruption as the greatest curse, yet also the richest resource for women's writer. Like in chapter four, Woolf talked about how Jane Austen wrote in her family sitting room and is interrupted every time a visitor enters as she has to hide her manuscripts away. And the unnecessary worry over a visitor entering has possibly cut her stream of thought countless times. However, she overcomes this and her writing is praised by Virginia Woolf as without hate, without bitterness, without fear, without protest, and without preaching. Mm-hmm. Um, and that also leads into another important point that Woolf raised that I want to mention. The fact that women have not historically been granted this space or even time for interrupted thinking also shapes the history of their literary achievements. That is, um, I think they tend to write more prose and fiction rather than poetry or plays, since one is, since when one is writing fiction, as Wolf suggests, a less concentration is required. Uh, so, do you think that this has now changed in our current society? Do women now have enough uninterrupted time of their own to explore poetry and plays? I, I don't think so. I think we're heading toward that change in some societies, and women definitely have more intellectual freedom now. But in my culture, for example, many people still think that it's natural to assign women household duties well, they're bound to financially depend on their husbands. And not only in writing, I think that many women have missed their opportunities in like creating arts, composing music, or setting up a successful business just because of the interruptions in their life. And this connects to how Lisa missed her opportunity <laughs> yeah. to buy the precious mini fridge because she has to fulfill her role and wash the dishes. This is just the harsh truth about our society. Right. It's kind of sad that her essay still applies to our world today, despite being written nearly 100 years ago. So I guess the conclusion for our session today would be, by constantly using interruption as a motif throughout her work, Virginia Woolf emphasizes her argument that a private room is a basic requirement for women to be able to write, and the image of a room that a woman author can own and used to write in away from the demands of traditional womanhood is a powerful symbol of women's intellectual freedom that Wolf strongly advocates. Well, although interruptions and distractions are, well, surrounded us a lot, um, in the future, let's hope for the world to become a place where women can pursue whatever they want without being interrupted. Also, let us hope that Lisa's dad could wash the dishes for her and she can get her mini dream fridge in the future. Dang, Lisa, we really hope you get that mini fridge. Everyone back in the studio is rooting for you. Yeah, for sure. Um, <coughs> no, wait, I Yeah, and I really like how this segment ties back to the writing style that Virginia Woolf used that I spoke a bit about at the beginning. And the way that she just conveys her point through the narrative and the story itself, it's, I, I just really like that about A Room of One's Own. It's very unique and enjoyable. And now, the weather. Wow, it sure is wet out there. All right, now for this next section, we have a very, very special guest coming on to speak with us about uh, class and its place in a room of one's own. Welcome to the funny section of a podcast of our own. I am your host, Gorilla, and today I have a special guest with me. He is an economist, literature critique, historian, politician, engineer, you name it, he works it. Mr. Jim Hello, hello, very, hello, very nice hello. to be here. Yes, yes, let's go, let's go. Okay, so, Virginia Woolf, 
age rooms of one own is a novel, but not really. An essay, but not really. And a book, but not really. Written on women and fiction and what a woman requires in order to write fiction. What a woman needs. It very much is a feminist text. However, class and money is very important in the book as well. It is a key factor. So, okay. what points do you think Virginia Woolf specifically raise about money in *A Room of One's Own*? Uh, yes, one of the one. I think one of the more very interesting parts of Woolf's text is that it simply reflects the more general inequalities and divisions of our society, uh, as well as those uh, specific struggles faced by women. Uh, In this way, Wolf expresses that women are more a prominent example rather than the entire issue itself. Uh, when society is divided among those who are educated and those who are not, uh, those who own capital and those who do not, the lower classes will suffer the restrictions imposed from above. Uh, you can see this represented quite clearly on page six. Uh, Wolf speaks about how her thoughts are interrupted by a beetle who tells her she's not allowed on the grass. Uh, later on page seven, she relates how she is not allowed inside the library. Wolf uses these examples to express how women are very often denied intellectual expression in a, in a society designed to accommodate men. Uh, however, it is important to note that it is not women specifically that are uh, not allowed on the grass or in the library. It, it is only fellows of the university that are. Uh, both women and the poor are excluded from this privilege. I find this to be uh, an important theme to the book rather than an oversight by Wolf. Uh, you can see Wolf make numerous references to class and wealth throughout the text. During the luncheon, the food is described in great detail, emphasizing the prestige and extravagance of the event. Uh, during this scene, Wolf actually specifically makes note that uh, coal miners are certainly sitting down to less. Uh, later on page 90, Wolf expresses the hierarchy present in a capitalist economy stating that those without secure finances have hardly a chance compared to those who are more well off. She says that we may prate of democracy, but actually a poor child in England has little more hope than the son of an Athenian slave. Once again, directly comparing uh, the current economic organization with earlier, more obviously oppressive systems like slavery and feudalism. Uh -huh. uh, near the beginning, she also notes the sheer amount of money that it would have taken to construct the universities. Uh, going into detail on how the money must be constantly influxed and naming the privileged classes who undertake the funding, initially the kings and lords, and then the merchants, not only expressing how bricks are laid and societies are built only for those who have the means to do so, but also drawing a direct connection between those two classes who differ not in their qualities, but by time. Uh, one interesting note uh, also about the luncheon. Uh, it is interesting how Wolf uh, specifically describes this event. I, I brought it up earlier, but mm -hmm. it is given an almost magical quality. Such exquisite detail is used to give the luncheon a, a bright expressiveness. Not only does she list out and describe the copious amounts of food, but the flushing of glasses with wine as if they are alive and filling on their own accord. The uh, electric light, which she calls brilliance. Uh, mm -hmm. It imposes an almost trance-like feeling of pleasure and vanity. Wolf says, We are all going to heaven, how good life seemed, how trivial this grudge or that grievance. And yet there is a hole in the fabric of this luncheon, a mistake, something that was not taken care of. Wolf notes that there is no ash tray, and because of this one has to go to the window to dump ash. And looking out of the window, one may see a cat without a tail. In this way, Wolf expresses how the extravagance of the upper classes can disconnect someone, veil them from reality, and it is only a, a small hole in this facade that allows her to see the cat without the tail, a clear representation of those who have not compared to those uh, who do. You know what's quite interesting? Wolf includes a lot of points clearly talking about an unequal society. However, she herself may have held classes and very much hierarchical view because she herself was born into quite an affluent family educated from a young age and received a substantial inheritance from her aunt interestingly wolf also held a lot of anti-colonialist view and anti-imperialist view views while simultaneously she was quoted saying in 1920 
The fact is the lower classes are detestable and imbeciles should certainly be killed. Kill. Jews are a greasy. A crowd is both an ontological mass and is again detestable. Germans are akin to vermin and some baboon faced intellectuals mixed with sad green dress negros and negresses looking like chimpanzees. At a peace conference, Kensington High Street revolts one stomach with its immutable women of incredible me- mediocrity drafts as dishwater while she was married to a Jewish man. She often criticized herself for being so as so, listing out various qualities of Jews that she did not like. While on a cruise, she wrote that there were a great many Portuguese on board, Portuguese Jews on board, and other repulsive objects, but we keep clear of them. However, mm. it's also quite interesting to keep in mind that she is an anti-fascist, but it's mostly because of them wanting to be more conservative and reinforcing patriarchal hierarchy, and not necessarily because of their anti-Semitic views. So yeah, well, what are your it, thoughts on it could, that? It could possibly be about that as well. I mean, but uh, it, it does indeed seem odd that uh, well, Wolf had many progressive views. Uh, she also seems to struggle to fully detach herself from the more uh, classist and racist rhetoric of the time. There are uh, very many odd contradictions between these uh, different beliefs that she held. Uh, it makes it difficult to determine exactly what she r- really uh, thought. Uh, you can even see this represented clearly in the book. On page 93, she says, you have never introduced a barbarous race to the blessings of civilization as if uh, doing such a thing would be an accomplishment it is odd considering her other uh, anti-imperialist and anti-colonialist views i see so how do you think virginia wolf can improve on her points how far do you think she raised them you know Mm, yeah so there's I think she did a, a very a great deal to express uh, the uh, themes of class and sexism present uh, in her book. I mean, I uh, certainly picked up on them. Uh, but if Wolf had wanted to go further with the theme of class, she could have directly addressed the organization of society that uh, re- reproduced this inequality as well. It would have been good to recognize some other inequalities reinforced by the same system, such as racism. Mm -hmm. So, despite her flaws, obviously her work is very much valuable. So, how should we interpret her work in modern day? Uh, Well, yes. So, I did just uh, say that she uh, could potentially have improved her work by uh, recognizing some other inequalities. But, of course, she could not recognize these things. But uh, one thing I find very interesting is that, of course, well, we do today. We recognize these things, and that makes Wolf's message quite important to us. We can extend it. We can go where she never did. And and that that we have her ideas and philosophies to build off of makes her an important part of progressive history. Uh, Despite her unfortunate qualities, I think it's important to use Wolf in this context to recognize that her work and intellectual works of the past as a whole are not something to be taken simply at face value and unquestioningly swallowed, but they must be examined and interpreted to be extended for modern conditions. It is this that allows us to grow our intellectual culture, to use the legacy of the past to create the future and leave a legacy of our own. Yes. So this is something that is necessary for many historical figures. You may uh, recall another writer, uh, mm-hmm. H.P. Lovecraft, was oh. a great writer that left some of the greatest works of horror in the English language. Though the fact that he was also extremely racist is something that has to be addressed with his work, not completely abandoning one in favor of focusing his legacy around the other. Okay, yes, very good points. All of them I agree with. So anything you want to say to close out? the podcast or our session, oh you know I'm, I'm 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 very 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 happy to have had this uh, opportunity to speak with, with you today and uh i i i think uh virginia wolf has made a very a very good book here yes anyways 
before we pass this off to the next se uh, section, I would like to say a statement. The Industrial Revolution and its consequences have been a disaster for humanity. Goodbye. Okay. Wow. 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 Yeah. That that was certainly some good points about the way that class is presented in a room of one's own. And it's kind of discussed a little bit earlier during this podcast. But the, the fact is that if you look throughout history, the majority of literature will come from class will come from people who form the upper class of society of the time. And a consequence of this is that, yeah, the base of literature for future writers and readers does end up getting quite skewed towards the general opinions of those classes. Now, Ajit, I think that there is something that you really wanted to speak about about this episode. Uh-huh. Now, yes, earlier on, um, a Gorilla and Mr. Chimp mentioned... Uh, uh, Virginia Woolf's views on other people and um, I kind of I found an example of this in the book actually and uh, at the end of page 50 uh, there's a quote where Virginia Woolf writes it is one of the great advantages of being a woman that one can pass even a very fine negress without wishing to make an English woman out of her now uh, negress of course uh, refers to a black woman now there's a there's a lot to unpack here that we don't have time for but i just wanted to touch on a couple things for one when i first read this part of the book it just kind of devalued the rest of the points that virginia wolf was trying to make on stuff like inequality and oppression in society because i think i think it's hypocritical to talk about one sect of society and talk about how that one part of it is oppressed and then also talk about um this other part in such a derogatory way. I think that if you're going to discuss inequality, you should discuss inequality in all parts of society and among all people. But that's just me, I don't know. Yeah, Ajit, I agree, but I think we shouldn't necessarily discount an author based off of uh, events and choices they've made in their personal life or just their own biases. Like, their works can still be considered uh, very influential and very um, beneficial to society as a whole, even if the individual wasn't exactly. Yeah, and I, I do kind of agree with that. I think that there still is great value in like in studying Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own and how it speaks about the like role of women in particular. And I think that you'll just find that any analysis might fall short in areas where the writer is not necessarily an expert, right? Like mm -hmm. Virginia Woolf was a court she was a woman so she was an expert on being a woman um and so as thus her knowledge of writing about women is greater i just think that we have to kind of take it as it is sort yeah. of yeah i feel like this just kind of like uh brings in this like greater problem of separating a creator from its creation whether because the creator is problematic or like because of the creator's perspectives and just kind of studying a work mm -hmm. on its own mm -hmm. I, yeah i think that there is definitely value there yeah. Um, it, from like a literary aspect, it's probably the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it is generally a good idea to sort of isolate it. I think we should look at things through like two approaches because it is definitely important to look at their biases and their influences. But I think looking at the work uh, and kind of like a void also helps to give us like different perspectives and mm -hmm. other ideas. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, there is a lot to talk about there, but we got to move on to our next group. Holly and Madeline discussing authorial decisions in a room of one's own. Hi, this is Madeline. This is Holly. Hi, guys. Hi. And we're going to be talking about some of the authorial choices that Virginia Woolf makes in her acclaimed... It's not a novel. It's uh, it's an essay. It's a messy essay. It's a messy <laughs> essay. Yeah. With fiction blended and interruptions all over the place. But what this does is it only strengthens her thesis that she's making. Yes. Which is that women need money and a room of their own in order to produce fiction. Yeah. Um, what was your first kind of opinion on her book after reading like the first two chapters? After the first few chapters, um, I, I feel like this is definitely the sort of book where you need to 
accustom yourself to the author's writing style because it's <laughs> it's it's a very um, unique way of seeing the world, way of like phrasing her sentences and way of structuring yeah. her argument, right? So it takes some getting used to. <laughs> um, I know that a lot of people in our class kind of had a bit of a hard time with this book, and I, I can see why because um, her writing style really is all over the place <laughs> in a lot of ways. It truly is, yes. Um, but also just the, like, something I really loved about this book was the imagery that she uses and just, like, the way that she describes mundane events such as, like, two different um, meal times and yeah, just, like, going I love how luncheon. she sees, I love how she sees the world and I love how she connects every little moment in this book to her thesis. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm kind of the same. I found her book really hard to comprehend in the first, like, couple chapters. And I mean, it doesn't get any easier as you go through, like, probably chapter three, chapter four. It doesn't get easier, but you kind of reach a point where you've accepted yeah. how she's writing and you just have <laughs> you to just, go with you the just flow. Go with, you just go with it, um, yeah. But yeah, like, I'm a type of person who has to lay everything out, kind of, and look at it all and overanalyze it. So with the interruptions, I tried to do as much research or look a bunch of it up to kind of connect dots to see where she was going because you can see how her interruptions are very purposeful so in order to show that they were purposeful to me at least I had to dive deeper into that yeah, yeah. exactly there's such a purpose to everything that she's doing with her writing and with the experience that she is creating for the readers with these interruptions just like peppered throughout her whole book and it, it causes the reader to need to like sit down <laughs> and think about like okay what is going on and um like how how do I process this work with all the interruptions and what this does is it parallels these statements that she's making about the difficulty of writing when you do not have a room of your own right mm -hmm. because um she's writing this book as as a woman um and she's constantly distracted as she's um like going about like the experiences that she has um, in this book as she like does her research as she like goes to libraries and looks out the window like she's constantly being interrupted True. and that just furthers the um, statements that she's making about yes. like how <laughs> interruptions make creativity and genius and writing far more difficult. No, she does seem to take like, proving her point to the next level by including, like, these interruptions. And just, like, as I was reading with the interruptions, because that's, like, what I was, like, super focused on, right, is, like, trying to fully comprehend these interruptions. And one of the interruptions on page seven, or I kind of thought of it as an interruption, it was her at one of her dinner times or, like, her lunch, and she was talking about prunes, and she was, like, prunes are a vegetable. And then in brackets it was, like, they're not a fruit, and I, in, like, closed the bracket, and I was like, why do I care? Like, I don't, <laughs> yeah. kind of thing, but it just shows, like, how distracted she was. Yeah, that aspect of, like, the wandering yeah. of her writing as she writes, mm -hmm. because she's experiencing so many distractions in the process of her writing. Yeah. Um, and I also found that this book was very difficult to read when you were distracted. Yeah. Like when when I was um, around like the middle of the book, I um, it was over the weekend and I was traveling. I was with family. I was actually in the middle of um, eating peanuts that I was allergic to because it was like <laughs> a food challenge medical test to see if I was still allergic to peanuts. I am still allergic to peanuts. Anyway, I was having an <laughs> allergic reaction reading this book um, and my family was there and they were just like talking amongst themselves. Yeah. And I found it so hard to focus on the book in this environment of distraction, of noise. I actually turned my hearing aid off so that I wouldn't have to hear my family talking amongst themselves and I could just like focus on the book. And it was still difficult, like even yeah. in silence, like in this environment. So if to be able to read this book, you need a room of your own. I can only imagine how difficult it would be to write a book yeah. like this without a room of your no, own. No, because, like, right? even your story kind of proves her, like, essay even exactly. more. Exactly, yeah. Which is super funny. So, what if, like, 
What, in your opinion, is the difference between truth and fact in her story? Truth and fact. Okay, so this is something that, like, immediately grabs my attention, mm-hmm. like, even in the first chapter. Um, one, Some of my favorite quotes actually come from page four um, in the first chapter. Okay. Um, when she's talking about almost, like, introducing this half real, half unreal setup of mm-hmm. her book. Um, she uses the quote, um, I is only a convenient term for somebody who has no real being. So when she's referring to herself as I throughout the majority of this book, she's actually like constructing this character of Mary Beaton, um, which is like separate. It's almost like an alter ego. It's like separate from Virginia Woolf. Yeah. Um, also, like fiction here, and this kind of goes back to what you were referring to. Fiction here is like is likely to contain more truth than fact, mm-hmm. and that was just like that sentence to me. The way that it's um, creating this difference between the idea of truth and the idea of fact um, was just so, like, I I feel like it does such a good job of of explaining, um, like, her whole setup with Mm -hmm. this book and, like, the structure of, like, the genre that it falls into. Yeah. Um, Because she's conveying truth in her book through, like, the female experience of distraction and of struggling to find money in a room of your own. Um, but there isn't necessarily a whole lot of facts in her yeah. book. Like, for example, um, she uses so many of the same names for the same characters. Mm-hmm. Um, she uses the name, like, Oxbridge for a university, which like, yeah. isn't a real university. Yeah. So the facts are blurred and often somewhat non-existent, mm-hmm. but truth is conveyed through... that lack of fact yeah like i often find like truth and fact are very interchangeable yeah like you think that they'd be synonyms in this context they're they're not not. they're not at all very distinctly separates the two and you can see that kind of in her separation from she like separates herself from her entire essay by writing as mary beaton mary beaton you know what i mean and she just like and she you even wrote about it she comes back at the end of the book. Yeah, I, I have the quote yeah. here. Um, uh, when she um, almost transitions out from this Mary Beaton persona back to Virginia Woolf, she writes, Here then, Mary Beaton ceases to speak. She has told you how she reached the conclusion, the prosaic conclusion, that it is necessary to have 500 a year and room with a lock on the door if you are to write fiction and poetry. She has tried to lay bare the thoughts and impressions that led her to think this. She has asked you to follow her, flying into the arms of a beetle, lunching here, dining there, drawing pictures in the British Museum, taking books from the shelf, looking out the window. She's referring to herself as she. Like, she's referring to Mary Beaton as if this is, like, a separate person, a separate character. And I find, like, when she does that, it's like she said, like, there's a quote in the foreword. She basically had said that she was expecting criticism, and she wasn't expected to take, like, be taken seriously and she when, knows that the she knows yeah, the environment that she's putting she this, does and like, it's feminist it's work like out into. in a way like and she even talked about how like she was a sensitive writer in 1915 when she first started introducing her works to the world and when she like 1929 she's like yeah it's gonna be taken as a joke but in a way you can kind of see how she still hasn't fully gotten over being super sensitive yeah. to the criticism because she's, but she's se- still putting it she out is. there she and just separates herself from it so empowering mm-hmm. about that even if she does need to yeah. almost like project these ideas onto the universal character of mary beaton who almost like could be any woman right because yeah. she refers to like i think it's all of the female characters in this work as uh, some variation of Mary, like Mary Beaton, Mary Carmichael, etc. Um, and what mm-hmm. this is, allows readers to do is, um, especially female readers, is to project their own experiences and identities onto the people in this, uh, in this book. Like, they can see themselves as any of the Marys, and they can identify especially with Mary Beaton, the narrator yes. of this work. Um, so, in that sense, Mary Beaton becomes, like, not only a shield for criticism because, like, it's not Virginia Woolf. It's, it's not her, beaten, right? It's like but it's also just, persona. like, the female experience mm-hmm. in general, which connects with women. And I feel like with using Mary Beaton and being so vague on the character's development and just, like, talking about Mary Beaton's life, right, mm-hmm. it makes it easier for the reader to relate to the book. Yeah. And be like, I can you understand can this. Yourself. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Whereas, like, if it was written in, like, 
in Virginia Woolf's perspective, it would... It's I, less relatable. It is less re- relatable in a sense, but also could be more to certain yeah. people. But when you take the writer kind of out of it and you have this, like, fake fictional character, you can, everyone can relate to a fictional character because exactly. there are so many aspects. But when you try to relate to a real person, there are so many different hoops you have to jump through to yeah. be like, oh, I relate to this one little aspect. Yeah. That's what I found at least. That's just, like, the relationship between how audiences view fiction versus how they view reality. Yeah. And it's, I think it's so cool how she blends the two in, um, in this text to allow mm-hmm. audiences to apply um, the ideas of reality and the experiences of reality to fiction. Because um, the fictional events in this book reflect reality, right? Mm -hmm. So it allows readers to, like you said, better relate to fiction while also making that connection to their own experiences in reality. Yeah, I truly enjoyed the book. And I think from our conversation, Madeline did as well. I loved it. Yeah, so I think we're going to end there for our podcast. And that'll be it. Okay, and that's it, guys. Thanks for joining us today, and I hope you enjoyed listening to all our different guests. Yes, even if uh, multiple groups talked about the same thing, it's uh, it was important to get all those perspectives in on this topic. All right, until next time, see you around.